put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. The Adventures of Robin Hood, 1938 Movie Review. It's Britain in 1191. King Richard the Lionheart has been captured on his way back from the Crusades. The powerless are being oppressed and excessively taxed by the corrupt and evil Prince John, more directly through the cowardly Sheriff of Nottingham, and the, the evil Buhis kind of smart and very willing to fight Sir Guy of Gisborne, who works for the prince. Robin is a knight, but he becomes an outlaw fighting for the poor with his dozens of merry men. Now, some say that the villains of this are just so-so. I disagree. All three of them are a lot of fun. And with three, we get to have some very different types. The, the prince is actually almost kind of charming. He's, he's definitely, you know, nobility. You, you can tell that he's, he's up there with, and yeah, the, the sheriff, very cowardly, always finding excuses why, you know, yeah, why he isn't getting things done, why he isn't rushing into the fight with his sword raised and Guy of Gisborne you know very scheming and you know there's a reserved quality to him and he hates Robin while I will admit I have not watched all the versions of Robin Hood. This, by the way, the two disc special edition is very worth buying. This is easily my favorite and I have watched you know the Disney one, the Costner one, the Russell Crowe one, of course the Mel Brooks one, the Rhythm Strategy game. I read various of the books when I was younger. I don't remember the titles. You know, I've watched plenty of others. I've just, you know, when I was a kid and I didn't note the titles and such. And yeah, this is by far my favorite incarnation. Going with the last minute notes. Very early on, Robin actually fires several arrows from horseback, you know, like while riding. I mean, he's not the one riding though. He's he's not the one, you know, guiding the horse. Some someone else is, but he's still sitting on horseback, turning around and firing arrows and hitting, of course, with with ease. Even from early on, he's shown to basically have no manners. Like he will step up on the table in front of the the nobleman. You know, he will point. You know, he. We meet him and Sir Guy very early on, and Robin literally threatens Sir Guy. You know, threatens to kill him if he doesn't let his servant go. Who poached a deer. And Marin, of course, has to be convinced that Hood is moral. And, you know, there's, of course, the, the you know, at the time, you know, she had to be a good lady. She couldn't just, you know, not, not just because a handsome man comes, no, no, no. But it really yeah, you can tell she really cares about whether you're doing the right thing or not. And 
yeah, that really informs and drives her character. We have a scene of a party in the forest between the with, with the merry men, and they actually attack some noblemen riding through the forest. There's one scene where the the characters aren't talking about love, but the music very clearly indicates that they're falling in love. There's that subtext to it, and this was one of the first where that really happened. You know, today we accept that, you know, you can you can infer, excuse me, you know, for example, falling in love or just big, you know, emotional changes without a character having to announce how they feel. That was so sort of left over from theatrical tradition where the words spoken were more important than the the actual visuals. You know, because when you were showing it to so many people, you could be sure that everyone could hear it if just the actor spoke up enough. But there are a ton of people there who couldn't see the stage. So, yeah. And in this, we get a very early case of that. And it really works beautifully. This is very distinctly, you know, non xenophobic. There's a. I mean, they make the distinction, which was very real at the time, of Normans and Saxons. And I'm probably going to mess this up, but I believe the Normans were the nobility and the Saxons were more common slaves and the like. And, and certainly they didn't own as much and, and such. And yeah, there's a point where Robin literally says, Norman or Saxon, the important thing is that they're doing good, that they're doing the right thing, and we shouldn't respect someone more just because of their heritage if they're not doing good. This uses shadows quite well. There's, you know, the very recognizable of a, a duel which in part takes place where you see their shadows fencing and yeah there are, there are others there are more sinister shadows in you know yeah in a scene that fits that very much and this also uses some very nice imagery when prince john is first talking about how he will take over rule in spite of the fact that richard did not leave him in charge he left I believe Longchamp's in charge. It, he left a, a another nobleman in charge, you know, knowing better than to leave him. You know, he couldn't exactly get rid of his brother. That wasn't just done back then. But he knew that his brother wasn't to be trusted with the throne. And King Richard literally says, you know, I will take over. And he accidentally spills. He knocks over a big goblet of a cup kind of thing of like wine and then he and Guy of Gisborne who've been talking look onto the the floor and the carpet and the the wine is spilling down onto and it looks like blood so you know saying blood will be spilled because of this this is deeply treacherous this actually does not hurt women too much which is very good it's it's not that these bad guys are you know hurting women so we don't have you know women in refrigerators instead it's that they there's there's some threat towards women but mostly it is that the you know it it happens to also befall the women but they are being unjust to everyone basically there's there's far more focus in this on the plight of the serfs and just yeah the, the powerless who are being downtrodden by you know john and his allies the the traitors to the king then time spent focusing on the the women's so so yeah it it doesn't treat 
women as this you know group that are just always needing to be rescued or the like and yeah I was very glad to see that there there's a lot of plot here the the movie is 98 minutes and Robin isn't yet a complete outlaw he has not you know given up his 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 noble his his title at at the start of the film he doesn't have the merry men yet we we see him recruiting the merry men we see him you know giving up the title yeah a ton happens here like there's there's not a scene that doesn't forward the plot everything really yeah it it doesn't waste any time there's one scene that is genuinely like Hitchcockian like and and you know this was yeah there, this wasn't directed by Hitchcock and it's not you know it, it is basically just the one scene but there's basically I'm not gonna give away exactly what it is but there's a someone has just written a note which very much reveals that they're in allegiance with someone else and we know where the note is hidden and the character who just wrote the note knows where it's hidden but the bad guy who just walked into the room we're like will, will he discover it and it just yeah it's it's great there are at least a few long takes where the camera will follow like I mentioned the the duel where some of the time we have the the shadow you know shadows fencing and then the camera pans more over and then you know we have characters in frame I'm not entirely sure if those were the same two that were shadow dueling there's at least one point where it's two other duelers who are shadow dueling but but anyway yeah and yeah the then they move into frame and they're fencing in front of the camera with Little John being tall and not necessarily coming across as you know the the smartest guy and with Friar Tuck being well fed for a man of religion <laughs> the two of them exchange a number of jokes where Tuck will call Little John stupid and little john will call the tuck fat and such and yeah they're they're very you know these scenes these bits of them exchanging barbs are great and it's again there there are few victims here really it's mostly people who you know they they may not be the most empowered at the you know right now but they either they have just been or they will be and yeah there, there are scenes that really turn especially the ones from the legends the two the the couple have great romantic chemistry and it you know it helps that they were apparently in love you know in real life the two actors this is one of the only films I've watched with these actors I have not watched an awful lot of films from this period and especially not you know I've watched a, a bunch of silent pictures but not very many here in the early days of sound now you in this you could really see yourself joining and fighting with Flynn's Robin Hood he's such a winning personality such a compelling speaker and fighter for justice you yeah utterly like you you cheer when the merry men do and you know those so inclined those who are into romantic and handsome men are you know fall in love with him and you know those of us more inclined to be attracted to women we've you know known self to either preference 
we've utterly fallen in love with de Havilland, her innocence, her devotion, her passion, and just, yeah, and even if you find yourself not falling in love with either of them, much like in The Amazing Spider-Man, especially the first one, but also the second one, you fall in love with their love, you know, you really want to see these get together and stay together. And she is distinctly moral and she's actually part of the plot, not a mere romantic interest and, you know, really showing that women can be more, girls can grow up to be more than romantic interests, waiting around to be rescued. And the actor who plays Little John in this played him in three different films, not directly connect, not, not same continuity, spanning 28 years. And you can see why he makes a fantastic Little John. This has a ton of well-delivered, clever dialogue. I already mentioned the, you know, traded insults between, you know, and Robin also insults the, the nobles and they, you know, snipe at him with various, yeah, uh, there's, there are a lot of great exchanges. Some elements of this are dated, but the film remains great nonetheless. This has a comedic tone and is absolutely unmissable. A classic, an oldie, old school, good versus evil kind of thing. And it's for the whole family. Although, do note that back then, films that were made for the whole family, there, there are mentions of some really brutal things and a few on-screen brutal, brutal things. But, you know, it's... Yeah. You'll, you'll determine for yourself. It, you know, I always say, if you can, watch it by yourself first. Before you show it to your children, see how you feel about it, or, or read, like, detailed descriptions of what's in there. And, yeah, genuinely promotes great values. You know, you should protect the defenseless. Those in authority should be just everyone should be able to get by on the money they make and a leader should serve the people and be show himself worthy of being a leader rather than just you know using the title to to garner respect there are a number of noblemen in this who clearly do not deserve their titles and they're dealt with by robin and his merry men it is impossible not to be swept up in the exuberance, color, and fun that this is soaked in. It's a cheery film, there are glitter on the costumes, you know, and yes, it gets cheesy, theatrical, silly. It works for this kind of film. This is not gritty or realistic. It's a fairy tale, and it owns that. It never shies away from that. And this has a much beloved score, which was composed by a man who had made, had composed very emotional operas. He had not done action, and he didn't feel like he was right for it. But yeah, he he they, you know, the approach was use the emotion, and it works. And again, that's part of where this subtext in the music came from, and just. Yeah, you, you never feel like the score is off for the, neither for the emotional and dramatic scenes, nor for the action scenes. And this has excellent sound effects. This is one where an, an early case of the, the flying arrow having that great kind of noise where, where really you can practically feel it the the rush of air as it just flies through the air this was the most expensive Warner film at the time and it really paid off this has more finesse to the sword fighting than in medieval times 
and this has one of the all-time best climactic sword fights. The the sword fight feel like fights, not fencing exhibits. And at the same time, again, they do have these, you know, this this choreography where in in the silent films it was more just waving their swords at each other. No, no disrespect to the, the silent films, but this was in this they they looked at that and they said, let's try this other thing and yeah, I'm glad both exist. Both are a lot of fun, and yeah, you can really get into the choreography in this one. The action is fast, energetic, exciting, and there's a ton of it. The, the, the choreography does not make it feel inorganic. Rather, it does always feel like very natural, like this is really happening. And this uses a lot of practical effects and stunts. This had the most stuntmen on any one production at the time. And you will see people take arrows to the chest. And, you know, they, they used like a, I think they had like wood something or other right under the costume so they wouldn't be hurt. It probably wouldn't fly today though. But part of how it was achieved was also that they used the renowned world renowned archer called the greatest the world's greatest archer at the time Howard Hill who also did various other trick shots including Robin Hood splitting the arrow at the archery tournament and indeed this has all the memorable scenes of the folk tale and legend you know the the staff fight between Robin Hood and Little John over a passage over the river you know, Robin Hood provoking the feisty but very moral Friar Tuck into a sword fight, and yeah, others that I maybe shouldn't mention. But if you know the the if you know the the legends, you can probably guess some of the other things that are in here. There are a few more I could mention. Robin Hood crashing and later escaping from a party at one of the nobleman's castles, you know, presenting a poached deer to, you know, and very directly insults the, the powerful, you know, more directly than his numerous actions already had and this is still this is again before he is declared an outlaw before he relinquishes his title and this had tons of extras sets and costumes and just yeah amazing really just a ton to to take in and some some call it gaudy and yeah maybe and it is, of course, presented in glorious Technicolor, and yeah, just the 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 color, the texture. It's it's amazing. It's a feast for the eyes. You you could watch this with the sound turned off, and it would still be amazing. And as others have pointed out, this has the sweep and the breadth of silent films that preceded it. It's grand, and you know it does justice to the Robin Hood legend. Now, and we see Robin Hood take down a number of knights who hurt the powerless. I've read other parts of this franchise. The links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.